in this video, I'm here with Mike. How's it going, buddy? Good. Mosaic Roto, and we're going to go over. Mike's going to show us on some testing procedures in the lab and actually how your resin's made that makes kayaks, correct? Right. Yeah. Well, and there we go. we develop them from scratch. So I think you guys want to stick around because this is going to be fun. There's a lot of cool stuff to check this out. So, yeah, let's do it, man. Pallets to paddles. Let's do it. <laughs> Pallets to paddles. I like it. Yeah. Will it? Oh, yeah. You, you don't care if I break it? it? We do care if you break it. But okay. I got more. No. <laughs> I don't care enough. <laughs> I don't care enough. But, but, but you had to push on it. Most of them that you buy like that, if you do like this, it'll snap right there. Yeah, that, I hope no, that wasn't your only one. No, I got one other one. Thanks, buddy. Oops. <laughs> that was our prototype. Yeah, okay. Six weeks is going to be right. it's now, Six right. weeks anyway. down the tubes. So the flex, the flex mod on this is like a 20th of your kayak resin. Okay. So it's flexible so that when a when a motorboat comes up and hits, you got an outdoor restaurant. Oh, yeah. But this protects the wood pile. So the wood piling will last longer because it's not getting banged up by the boat and exposed to sunshine. Yeah. And this is roto molded. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a roto molded Rotomolded. product. So that would be something for power boats more to protect docks. And soft I still want to see a kayak out of that to see if we get some bounce off a rock. You get bounce. It's a traditional mill and what we do is we have settings like any machine to create the product that fits the specifications that we've been showing today for the powder flow, the particle size distribution, the overall um, moldability of the material, that starts here. And what we do is we're taking this pellet, okay, and we're turning it through this machine. High quality powder. See how hot that is. Wow, that's, that's warm. Yeah. So, so are you just grinding it up? We're grinding it into a powder that has to hit a particular specimen. So this is what's always in the kayak factories. What yeah. Gaylord box of powdered resin. Right. But it doesn't start out as that. It starts out as pellets like that which this is what so that pellet would be you would buy it from a like a manufacturer i buy that from a major chemical company yeah so those pellets aren't made here no yeah but i will show you pellets that are made here this is the pellets we make this is not a kayak resin we're going to say it is so we make this into a tan kayak resin. So this material is made, we do make a pellet, we take various seed stocks of material. So those pellets will be turned into powder? Yeah, yeah. and we make the pellets here. So let me, let's let these guys go through. I want to show you the silos. Seven pellets, there's seven pellet silos here. All different plastic. Brought big, in, they fill that up out of like a truck. truck. Yeah, big bulk truck. So these two will hold 180,000 pounds of material. Then you got 120s, and then you got. Wow, those things are massive. They're massive. Yeah. So that's all then conveyed by air into the facility. So our workers maybe only touch a couple percent of any formula because even though there's 100 pounds of pallets hitting the floor or hitting the box it's all being pneumatically conveyed and then we put our special stuff in at the extruder and these particular uh, resins to a great degree are what we build all of our formulas off of so we'll take a material that's really good for impact but isn't very stiff and we'll make it stiffer we'll take a material that's very stiff and isn't so good for impact or elongation and we'll add the ingredients to make all of those things come so there's a lot of chemistry that comes into this but just to get an idea of the scale, we use this much plastic every week making this, any variety. So of what you're saying, this is one week's worth of plastic in these silos. That's about half a million pounds of plastic. At one point. And that would, and you turn it into the powder. We will turn it into colors or powder or whatever, and then we can take that and pulverize it down to roto powder. We can take it directly from here and, and turn it into just natural powder, or we can blend them together and create something special. So white water and kayak is on the something special side. 
Is this running? Is this, yeah, it's making those pellets. So how that works is that's melting the plastic and making it into an alloy. So I'm taking many things and turning them into one, taking inexpensive things and turning them into something greater and making an alloy. That pipe goes up and over to a dryer. That dryer then drops those pellets in dry into that box, and that box will go back here and we'll make powder out of it. And I'll show you those pellets. So we're taking a stiff material that doesn't have any impact, mixing it with a, another material that has better impact to create. So we might take as many as four different plastics and create what's called an alloy, and then that alloy can create the material that you would be paddling, that you'd be having your kids slide down, that you'd be holding you know, your rain barrels for your, your garden, you know. Yeah. All that can be made out of a rotomolar, can be made out of these processes. So this is a big Play-Doh machine. It's just putting strands out to get cut right at the face and the pellets go over and get dropped into the, into the box. Which we just looked at the pellets. Did right. you add the color to them also? Yeah, we made yeah. the color. So back here, yeah, so it's pulling out of here. Yeah, so we pulled, we delivered this from the silo. Yeah. So after you made the tan pellet, that's the pellet. Yeah, so you didn't buy these pellets. We made them. You, yeah, so you use that. We use it to create. So we use that as a raw material similar to making a cake. I don't have the chickens, but I can buy the eggs. I don't have the flour, but I can buy the flour. Yeah. But I make a cake, and that cake then be the cake. Because this may look like flour, but it's really the cake. And that, it's got, and that could be any color. If you wanted to do green, yellow, whatever. Six million natural colors, yeah. you can do them all. And, and that particular material may have as many as eight ingredients in it. criteria. Just where they clean the machine? Yeah, so you gotta get the color out. So this will be recycled. We'll send this off to be ground up and we'll turn it into boat docks and you know log you know agricultural parts. So it's no waste. Yeah so it's a no waste facility. This plant generates almost no waste. Yeah. Do that no waste. No waste. Very efficient. How much recycled plastic is in this stuff? None here, but we do have a line that was up front that runs 100% recycled plastic, and again, for less value products. If you're gonna make a flower pot, a big flower pot, we'll use recycled. If you're gonna make something like a dock float that's gonna be blown full of foam, is that where you recycled. get, so what about like a kayak seat? I know they would use regrind resin. Only good stuff, on only kayak grade. Yeah. And what we'll do is we'll take it directly from that manufacturer, bring it back, recycle it, and send it back to them. So it'd be the same resin. So like a warranty kayak will come in. A lot of people ask about where my warranty goes. So you would turn that shell in, it gets cut up, it would grind up and back into pellets? Yeah, you can. Or it's mostly the cutouts and the screw turnings and all oh, of the rim cutouts and the so hatch cutouts. When you make a 33-pound shell, you put 40 pounds in the thing because you had to cut out yep. the shell, the hatches. So those hatches and shells come back. We grind them up and we turn them into black or multicolored material. Your hands are clean. <laughs> yeah, this stuff isn't poisonous, right? No. Okay. <laughs> you can actually, I've been, that, I've that, been that, touching it all. So we'll talk about that too. Heavy metal free is important. Yeah. We've been heavy metal free since we started. Okay. A lot of companies are not or have not always been that way. There are still a few colors and kayaks out there that may have lead, cadmium in them. So you have your own roto oven here yeah. to make boxes. Well, everything is done here. So this is your little oven where you would make, oh, look how cute it is. Isn't it cute? <laughs> look at this thing. I don't know how to open it. We can make little tiny kayaks. John has to come back here. Oh, it's okay. We, yeah, don't start it up or anything. It's a cute little girl. The FPS Roto Flow, and basically it can make. You have a mold. A you make box. those boxes make the for the taxi. And the dog bones and everything. Yeah. yeah. So that way you're controlling how it was molded, if it was done correctly, and all that. Right. Quality standpoint. 
you know, from a quality standpoint, a quality manufacturer will have names, lot numbers, dates of manufacture, and, and specific codes tied to specific. This uh, is all the finished goods. This is all our finished goods. Ready to go to everything a kayak from, company or everything from dock floats, kayaks, water sports, playground equipment, um, safety equipment. Uh, yeah, because up. you guys are a premium resin maker, in my opinion. Yeah, eighty percent of what we do is special. Yeah, so we don't have a lot of just generic junk. We're either doing something that's a value add, or we're doing something that's important to make that product be what that product is supposed to be. And ultimately, that's what we started the business to do. So we wrote them all that square. So they've been thickness tested. That's what the numbers are. Yeah, you freeze it to minus 40 degrees yeah. in a deep freeze. Yeah. And these are gonna be used for drop, drop testing. Dart. And we'll show yeah. you the drop Which dart. I've done that process right. more yeah. than once. And yeah. we've got, basically, you're gonna recognize it. Okay. Except you don't have to crank it, it goes up with a... Eight pounds? Uh, 10 pounds. 10 pounds, see, it went up since I was doing it. Maybe it was always 10 pounds, I just forgot. So the 40 below drop dart test. 10 pound dart. You already got it in there? Yep, the magnet's right there, you can see it. We've got a, a magnet here with an electronic signal going to it. So once we disconnect that signal, it'll drop the dart. Dart from here to there, okay? And that's what's going to impact the part. And this is a 10 pound dart, and every foot is 10 times the feet. So at one foot, it's 10 pounds of, 10 foot pounds of force. At nine feet, it's 90 foot pounds. The, the white water, threshold is six so 60 okay. foot pounds if you can be 60 foot pounds not brittle that's where white water has kind of accepted that that's good okay if it's brittle it's no good this is how you're doing the impact testing if someone came off a drop landed on a, a rock right this we would, would verify that the plastic when molded correctly yeah um, can handle 60 foot pounds in an area that big very sharp at 40 below zero, which puts a lot of pressure on the plastic. So the is what we believe is good plastic, it's kind of just drop it. So is this like the this improperly? Will a, this one was improperly cooked. So this would be an example of an overcooked boat yeah. landing on a rock. So he's at six. six. So this would be overcooked boat. That's an improper, improperly manufactured boat for this test. We made one improperly, but you can see what it was like. The colors, yeah, it's yellow. So that's an example of, in, in the processing, if you overcook a boat, it makes it brittle where you look at that. That's a pass. So there's no failure on that. That would be a failure. It's the same resin yeah. as the blue, just overcooked. Yeah, okay. Well, there you go. So yeah, that was... color. We did that for them. And this is done on every batch, or how many? We that do comes it in the development cycle, and we do it in the QC cycle. Okay. So this would be, if you order 10,000 pounds of it, we would do a drop in the middle to verify that everything's processing right amongst all the other tests for white. And a lot of manufacturers that purchase your resin does this too, also. This, yes. Some will, some, some will, but they have the option. In the world of kayaking, most of the good brands will do this kind of testing on occasionally yeah. through their process runs, especially in development, but occasionally throughout the week they'll do a they'll do a boat or a cutout to get an idea yeah. of where they're at. Okay. okay. So that's drop dart. This is our heat build box. What our heat build box does is it replicates a hot day in the south. So right now it's got an air temperature of 106 degrees. We draw a little bit of air through there. And then we do two things with this. We're going to measure overall heat build that the plastic picks up on a hot day. This replicates the sun, and the ambient air temperature is a feels like temperature. So we aim for 106 to 110 degrees, about as high as it gets in, in most of the places that are going to have a river to paddle. Why that's important is we build a Subaru. All right? Why is the Subaru? This is 10 inches long which is an average Subaru is 10 feet long. We'll hang a 12 inch piece of plastic off of, off of this and add weight to the sides of it so that 
if we get the plastic hot and we add weight to it, will it distort? So we that's, it down. this is simulating a roof rack. A roof rack. And it's you're calling it the foot. Subaru, so it'd be like um, putting your kayak on a roof rack. And we'll add weight or we'll tie it down wow. here to see, and then we'll see how much it deflects and work it back. Because I've seen, and you have too, about kayaks that have melted, and actually people have left them on their roof, come outside, and the bow and stern is all the way down, hanging off the top of the car. Which is why all the testing we just showed is important, is to, is to do that. Now we're at Death Valley temperatures. So, well, that's the plastic has absorbed the heat. The plastic now is the 150. The plastic is 150. So even degrees. though the outside air is 106, the plastic now is 150. Now because the pigments absorb the sun, hold heat, and, and infect the plastic. Now do different pigments hold different types of heat? Yes, Black, sir. white, pink, orange? So any color that's traditional color typically is going to hold a lot of heat. But we can build colors that will be cooler. So if you get a black, black is obviously worse than white. Yeah. White's as good as it gets, right? I did a test on it. I did a video on it and yeah. set it out in the sun. It's a big difference. Black, black does hold more heat. Yeah. But almost all colors have some black in it. Exactly. <laughs> So what you have to do is look at each color and go, okay, I'm gonna do a fishing boat and I'm gonna do it for Louisiana and we're gonna do it for redfish tournaments or we're gonna do it for sea trout tournaments or bass tournaments. And we want that boat to be able to handle three eight hour days in the, in the field. We can take a beige, a brown, a gray, a green, you know, any variety of traditional fishing boat colors and drop 20 to 35 degrees off of that traditional color just by manipulating the pigments. And, and the, the advantage that you have here, you make your pigment. Make so pigments you can alter, you don't have to like rely on someone else to say, hey, can we change this? You just go do it. Which is part of our sustainability story is that we do everything on this block. So we make the color, we make the plastic alloy, we, we pulverize it here and we ship it out of here. So you could have area. two black boats from two different manufacturers, two different resins. 30 degree difference. And there could be a 30 degree difference because you could actually formulate like a black one to take on less heat. Or a gray or That's a beige. Interesting. That's interesting. Or a interesting. gray yeah. or a beige. Any or color. A yeah. green, camouflage, all of it. We've done it for building products for years. And so we think it would be a really a benefit for fishermen. Especially. Definitely. I don't like getting in a hot boat in the summertime. You don't like fishing at 3 o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> in Louisiana when your boat's a skillet, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this is all part of the development of a kayak resin. Yeah. So we talk about developing resins for the market. We do this in the various markets, but this is what we do for the world of kayaks. We put that much effort in to developing our magnum grade. And what a lot of people don't know, you make decking material. We make a lot of different polymers. So yeah, so it'd be like the wood on a deck, it, but make, it's not wood. We make carpet, we make decking, uh, materials for those markets, and materials for roto. So we're, we cover a wide bandwidth of, of polymer products. And what we'll do is we'll replicate a year in South Florida, so July 1st in Florida, okay, in about six weeks. So for every year uh, of weathering that you need, it takes about six to eight weeks in this machine. So up here, we talk about a word called a radiance. And what a radiance is the amount of energy being put down by the sun at a particular time. Is this UV? This is UV. Okay. So this UV then uh, is being put in at an extreme condition to accelerate the weathering so that we can, in a year, we can get six to eight years worth of data off of what the plastic would endure in Florida. Can I open it? Sure. And so it has steps of water, so you'll see. Got some parts in there. Ooh, look in there. Yeah. So you just put those, we didn't just mess up. No, years, you're, no, 10 no, years of, uh, no you're fine, brother. I'm no, gonna let you do it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> stuff, yeah. uh, so we test the temperature here. It's called a black, uh, black panel te temperature. Now get up to like 145 degrees, so very hot. Yeah, it was running a hot. Uh, I mean, it's, it feels kind of warm, but not like super. Well, hot. It's only on for a few minutes. So, um, and then these will check color. We'll check how strong the impact is, how the flex holds up, any variety of different things. Put it up. Too bad I can't get one of those to take me backwards. I know, wouldn't that be great? H me backwards. Yeah, but DeLorean. Benjamin, Benjamin Button, that's what yeah, we should call it. DeLorean, we could do that. <laughs> and this this will run for an hour, and the test is going to go on for 1,298 hours. It's a 2,000 hour set. Temperature, 
of 2,000 hours of exposure to yeah. the elements. Right. Wow. And that's two years in Miami. Is there salt in there? Can you? We can put salt. This doesn't have salt. Okay. Polyethylene is pretty much impervious to salt water. Well, there you go. That's, I mean, that's why it's impacted in milk and all this other stuff. It's impervious to most liquids. Okay. So this this machine's called the ro ro tap. Rotap. So the Rotap. Tap. We're looking for particle size distribution of the powder so that when it goes into the mold, it will form as expected time after time, which is important to create consistency for the rotomolder so that they can make the boat correctly to process and consistently day after day, week after week, year after year, color after color. Our lovely assistant, Randy, is going to show you. So what we'll do is we'll take, we'll take 100 grams of our powder and we're going to pour it in the top. We'll put this back on. We're going to put a weight on top of it. Keep it where it don't flop around everywhere. And just to kind and of we'll keep do it. We'll see it shake and then we'll turn it off. So we're going to hit it for hit it on the top. So it's shaking and it's Each of these is a different screen. It's going to figure out what, it's going to knock it all through and it's going to stop on the screen of where it's at. We'll then create a particle size distribution curve, which will then either fall into the specification that you guarantee, or will not. And then we'll have to make it. And then we'll pull this in about six and a half minutes. Now you've weighed this before. You you know the weight of that before. Yes. So All you're doing is have weighing a net pan weight that shows right here. So it'll be 366. So we're just weighing what's inside there. As of right now, that doesn't weigh even a gram. So we'll put zero. And it has the specifications what we're trying to hit, and that's a very tight. That's tighter than the industry has historically required. Okay. okay, that's what we set ourselves to. Because what's this? Uh, what's this process called? It's called again? the row tap, and so we're looking at particle size distribution. Okay, and she's going to go and weigh each pan to see what that distribution is. So you could see how those screens, each screen is a different hole size, yes. and it's dropping through, and you can start getting seeing where where it's finer. getting smaller and smaller. Right. So so you're slowly going down each one. You're down to some of the most finest of it, and you're trying to find, you're writing down all that you find right there. Yes, so, and each one has a stat where it's got to be below, like this one has to be uh, below 41, um, above 10, and so we have that stats to make sure it stays within those levels. If it stays within those levels, it usually means it's good. As you get down to here, you can see and feel it's really, really fine. Go ahead, you're fine, no. So she's gonna do, um, this is called mill data, so we're looking at the quality of our mill, and which we'll show you the mill here in a minute. Now, is now what's why do you do a flow test? Is this the speed that that powder flows through a mold? Because there's nothing mixing that powder. Why rotomolds molds get great colors? You get these different shades because there's no screw melting the plastic into one big gray, right? So you get these great lines and streaks and two and three color formulas because you don't have shear, but because you don't have shear or anything that's controlling that flow, the powder has to be able to flow fast enough to cover in where all those inserts are for gear. So if your flow is too slow, it's going to create pockets and pores. If your flow is too fast, it may not set up correct on the inside. So you just dumped 100 grams there. You're about ready to pull the slide. And all you're doing is watching until that whole thing has just ran out. Yeah, right. and then she's taking a bulk density on that material to see how heavy the powder actually will be so you don't so you can fill your mold up. If it's too light, you can't get enough powder in the mold. Just like an hourglass without the bottom, huh? And you got a what? 27? 27.59. And we want to be sub 30 as a generic specification. And then our bulk will be 36.4. And depending on the resin, 32, right? So that could be different depending on manufacturer sure. what it's going to be used for and everything. Sure. Yeah. So for for these guys, they want they want 30. It's got to be 30 for kayak. Got to be under 30. Okay. But for some big toy, 35. Yeah. yeah. It's all about the shape of the boat. If you got a boat's got a lot of hard 90s. 
you're going to have to have fast flow where you're going to have lots of issues in those in those yeah. hard 90s. You got a turtle sandbox, you know, famous it's turtle rounded, sandbox or, it off or cozy coop. They made them to run them fast, you know. So they're they're not a performance thing. Your five year old sits there and makes sandcastles. Turtle sandbox to hold sand, rock and roll, great roto park. All right, flow testing, right? What's the little Easy Bake Oven for? The Easy Bake Oven, we're checking for contamination. Correct. So Brandy will show you this. She makes what we call a puck. If you, the reason why this is important is if you look here, we had some contamination. If we have black spots, purple spots, blue spots in it, then we cannot ship it off. It, it won't, it it's won't come out. Or throw away. Yep. Oh, so you've just, you've just put we virgin take resin the, in here and just put it in the oven and, melt and, it. and just melt it till you get. Kind of like our own little oven. See, that's yeah. all you need to make a kayak. That's it. An oven. How hard is it, right? How hard and is then it? we'll take it over here and look at it under the lighted microscope to look for any contamination. Because, you know, some things you can't see to the visual eye. And it is clear. So this isn't going to be like an impact. No. This is going to simulate. It's going to be boring. It's just going to put pressure on. And what we're going to generate is a number called Young's modulus. Okay. And what Young's modulus is the determination of stiffness. So when you talk about getting on a boat and standing and casting and fly fishing, getting in there and, and having action, this is, we're aiming for 135,000 flex modulus up to 180,000 flex modulus. Okay. So that's where the spec has historically been a 130 plus for kayaks, for good kayaks. Some of the, the cheaper stuff, is whatever. That particular formula should be in the 180s. Okay. okay. It was built, engineered for stiffness. But a minimum kayak stiffness should be in the 130s. Okay, so what you're doing, this is just a prayer. This, this is it's like a, a that's a stress. force yep. on that. And then this is basically a scale that's telling you how much force is being exerted. Yeah, and so, you, and it's going to bend it until it breaks? Un, or Until it hits a point where it says, okay, it's, it's quit reading. We've passed its maximum strength. It's going to start showing the curve. And this is very important in development and to a to a degree quality control. So once it touches, it'll start to grow. Flex strain versus stress. So any kayak that's under 130 is going to be more prone to oil so can, and it'll show out, it'll kick out an end calculation, and you can see it deforming. So will it just fold it completely up? Is that what it's going to do? It'll hit a point where it's no longer getting any resistance. And, and this this is how you would, what you were saying, you could kind of like stop the oil canning yes. if it's very low. So if you're, if you're under 130, don't tie it to your bumper. If you're under 130, don't leave it outside for too long on anything that's elevated because it's going to have a tendency to deform. In, in certain circumstances. And this would also, so this would be the flex in the actual this plastic. Is, this is the stiffness. Which it, which Whatever. matters a lot when you're paddling because all that flexing when you're paddling down river, you lose that energy every time. You want a boat, that's why carbon fiber boats or fiberglass yeah, are so so fast and smooth. They're yeah. just brittle. Yeah, but they're brittle. Right. So, so you, you want to get right to the point of a boat being kind of like super hard and right. stiff, but still flex when it hits so the rocks. So we make these polymer combinations or what we call alloys, we're trying to optimize impact and stiffness and, and overall toughness. Now it's on tests. the drop. So it's going to shut off here. Yeah, it'll, but it's based at the peak. The end part doesn't matter as much as yeah, this the is beginning just, part. The test is finished. You're and in that peak. Yep. Yeah. And That's gonna, what matters. And it's going to calculate for us here in a second. So you can stop it and calculate it. So this had a Young's modulus of 205,000. So it's a very stiff boat resin. It's a different it, it plastic. It feel pretty stiff for the size of it. Yeah. You so know, my thumb is calibrated to the 500. I know. <laughs> it does get to that <laughs> yeah. point. Yeah. So the higher the number, the stiffer the material is. Okay. So metal. What did we get on metal this? Metal might be a million. That's 200,000. And the minimum that we want to hit for a kayak is 130. Even generic wreck in a lake is 130. Tensile test or tensile elongation. So what we're going to do is use the same machine with a different fixture, stretch that plastic. We're testing to see how far it will stretch and how much force it takes to stretch it.
So it's being stretched right now. Yeah, and it's, it's almost spot it. in the bar. It's at failure. And then on the graph there, you can you see know, it tails off when it loads it, and then we'll create a an elongation percentage. This is isn't as of much interest in um, kayak, but it, it is of some I, interest because you don't want something that's very if easy you were to pull and bring. If you were panned on something, mm -hmm. like if your kayak got something you call a brooch pan, mm -hmm. and you were panned sideways, the boat's flexing around you. Yeah. That would, how that structure, that would actually matter Especially to me. Especially on the outside. Yeah, on so the outside. Because it can take it. It's being flexed against, say there's a, a rock right here, and one end's that way, one end that way, yeah. and you're inside it. You don't want it to fold on you. Well, see? And then that's why you want to get that the maximum. Amount, that's the amount of stretch, so that, you know, is it stretching that much? You know, that boat's not breaking and taking on water. Yeah, it still hasn't failed completely, right. technically. So you, this is important, but it's not as important as the flex mod versus the impact. But this also has a requirement to be greater than 3,000 for a kayak. We had a maximum load of 170 pounds and it elongated 420%. So it stretched four times its initial length and it hit right at 3,000. And that is kayak plastic. That is yeah. kayak plastic. It's probably a fishing boat, so it's it's not going to be under that kind of pressure. That's not a whitewater resin, but even not a whitewater resin, the Magnum product, it's almost whitewater specs. And, you know, so certainly can you take that down the Tuckasegee and fish for trout? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, because it's all class one and two, right? Yeah. The best. So you could take a Magnum Paddler resin down the tuck and not have to worry about it, and then you could throw it on Hartwell and fish for bass in the summer. So this is called a melt index? Melt this index. Is this procedure, this testing, is going to be the melt index. So I'll let her show you how. Let me tell you why. The why of the melt index, what we're looking for is to make sure that we have a constant melt flow, and that's a function of how much, uh, how fast that material will go through a set space in a set time. And that becomes important for consistency. If the material melts too fast, it shows either a defect or it's going to give you a molding issue. If it melts too slow, it may not fill out all the inserts and cavities. So what we want to do as a part of the development is we set up and say, okay, what are we targeting for melt, impact, flex, and, and tensile? And then we then we verify. Once we go to production, we make the millionth pound of something, we should have melt flow data on every box of yeah. it going through to know that it was consistently in this range. And that's this is predominantly a QC test that we do utilize for development. Do you, um, the the release added to it, do you add the release here we too? We can. But you, you normally don't, or what? I wouldn't say normally, I'd say it's 50-50. If an application requires more release, we can add the release. And what is release? What it is helps it? the mold, the part to demold. So when you see those kayak making videos, when they pop the lid open and they pop the boat out, if they stick, you're in there with crowbars and you're probably gonna scratch and dent the boat if you're lucky, or damage the mold. So what you want is that part to stick long enough to where it shrinks and falls off that you can just grab it. And so you don't have misshapes and all right. that. Yeah. So for a molder who does different shapes, he may or may not want release in every mold. So a guy that's got a really funky shape, he may want some extra release in that compound. But for a guy that's running relatively simple shapes, which kayaks aren't are the the bandwidth, right? You got some stuff that's real square. Yeah. She's tough to get out of mold if you don't release it. There's some blob boats are real sleek and round. They're pretty easy to Just release. Pop out. Yeah. So that's where you would cater to whatever manufacturer Customer needs. says, hey, we're having some trouble here. You pop a little release in it and make sure that they put and it And you add that somewhere, somewhere out there. We can do it in the extrusion process. There you go. Yeah. I forgot to ask you that while we Part were out there. Part of the special yeah. sauce that we add. Okay, we'll let it run for two Is that minutes? just the weight? Is all yes. that is? The standard so, weight. So it's a 2,300 gram weight for a set time and then she'll make the magic here. Uh, well, well, I cut it and we'll uh, weigh it up every two minutes. So the first, it'll be the first run will be two minutes, the second run will be two minutes. If you want to fast forward. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll fast forward through that. Yeah, yeah. so we'll just, yeah, you, you know, burn your battery. But you can see what it's doing. It's pressing weight if you look, there's on that mirror. material. And you just use that mirror to see. Yes, see up in there. Because if it doesn't come out clean, if it hooks, it won't give you an accurate result. So that, that mirror does it allows us to see to make sure that, that material hasn't hung and gives us a negative report. Equals a 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9,
and a 2.8. You'll add those up and average them and that'll give, them, give you your melt flow. So your melt flow will be a 3.4, which is in the proper specs. We'll test all the resins that come in from the silos to verify that they're right and they go in the right place at the right time because they, they float. Wow, that's a lot of testing that you guys are doing. It's a ton of testing and that's, and that's the, what sets it apart. That's really why a whitewater boat per pound is more expensive than you know, a, a flat water, basic extruded boat you yeah. get you don't get as much out of that extruded boat as you do out of a yeah because i don't think a lot of people know how much testing goes into it they think oh you just throw in resin in a box and it's right. ready to go right the rotor molded boats you get a lot of testing that's why they're a premium product and that's why they typically when they're configured right and the molders are responsible and are passionate about what they're doing um, you get a better product you think a lifespan of a rotor molded kayak would be for you, Wade, in an about expert. a year. <laughs> for, <I'm> <laughs> for me, <laughs> 15 years. So, so, so what you're doing? You're doing a, a flex test right, yeah, of the. Yeah. We want to see how many rotations the material can take under load and under stress, and that's important for when you when you have a small area that takes most of the abuse. So a boat takes a lot of abuse. But when you pedal, when you sail, when you have specialty um, uh, driving equipment on there, such as an electric motor or the pedal drive or, or whatever, that area takes a lot more abuse than the Yeah, whole, where the all the, the stress is. is. So the whole boat has to be able to take that kind of abuse so that you can configure and insert that in. Yeah, so each rotation is getting a flex. Yeah. It's flexing. And then it's a little heavier on that one because it's a thicker plastic is what you're saying. And that makes sense. Now this will eventually fail. Eventually they'll fail. But, um, you know, when we do it right and when we develop formulas specifically for that, we can get 500,000 revolutions. So 100,000 is considered good. And this is would be the same rotomolded plastic that would be in the kayak. resin was rotomolded here under all standard conditions. We cut the bones out and then we test it. So not just the area that holds that insert is tested, the whole hull is made out of that plastic and passing the feed for that area, that whole hull's that tough. Wow. So you engineer the whole boat to be able to handle the maximum fatigue point. So yeah, in, in, in closing here, Mike, what do, you, what do you got to add? Well, what Mosaic Roto has done and is doing is is committing to the world of whitewater, committing to the world of paddler and sailing uh, in rotor molded kayaks. And we think it's an exciting market. We like to fish and we like to go out and, and do these adventures in our boats. And we think that other people would want to have that same experience. And the plastic is an often um, misunderstood portion of the quality of that experience. And if the plastic fails in a wilderness setting or plastic just fails on your one Saturday off, it's, it's not going to be a great experience for you and whoever you're doing this with. And so at Mosaic, what we do, and hopefully we've illustrated today, is that the testing work that we do, the development work that we do, is all aimed around providing a great experience. And it is what we believe to be the number one, maybe number two supplier of all kayak grades in North America. Um, we believe that this industry, one, is exciting and fun, and two, needs to have this level of service and quality to, to grow it and to make it better, make it more enjoyable. And we've got generations of, of people coming up underneath that can get out in the woods in and, and this kind of experience, and, and we're dedicated to that. We've got four different grades of Magnum that are commercially available, and we can develop 44 more if we need to. For, the 44 for, Magnum. For and 44 it, Magnum. So Magnum is your... Uh... Drop the mic. That's awesome. <laughs> and so, yeah. Is so, it, so is that, that, when you say Magnum, that's your actual trade name? That's our trade yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it is to raise the performance, to be that... I like it. That trademark, it is the most powerful, strongest brand in this space and that's what magnum has signified to a lot of outdoors enthusiasts over the years and that's what we're trying to do with these products is create the most impact the most bang for your buck not necessarily the cheapest boat when you walk into your local sporting goods store your 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 family store whatever wherever you're going to buy your boat a shop you, you want to look for not the cheapest boat but the boat that's built to do the thing that you want it to do and you know, there's, there's versatility and there's um, specialization, and our grades of Magnum is the most comprehensive list 
of kayaking grade resins in the country. So appreciate your time and the chance to, to hang out with Wade. And, oh yeah, buddy, anytime. I only, love it. We've only done this for about 10 years now. So. I could talk I could talk kayaks, I could talk plastic, but this guy all day long. And, and it would be fun. So, and it'd be fun. It's been a yeah, great, it's not even like hours. work. It's not even like work, so. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, all right, Thanks, mate. Everybody. Yeah, dude, um, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks a lot. And um, how can anybody find you guys if they were looking to you like can go on mosaicroto.com, drop drop me a line. I'm uh, Mosaic Mike Hobart. Well, there you go. All right. Thanks a lot. And I'll link to that down below on how to get a hold of these guys. I'll put their website below if anybody wants to like check out Mosaic Plastics or Mosaic has Mosaic Additives, Colors mosaic and Additives. Mosaic Color and Additives. Because they do make additives and colors. You we, make colors. We, we pigmented. Have five locations in the United States and we do a ton of things in the world of sustainables and recycling as well. And Roto is one of our divisions and it's probably our most fun division. Yeah.